Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is for Behavioral Science 3010 Statistics for the Behavioral Sciences, and we're looking at the third online quiz for Chapter 8, which is about hypothesis testing. The first question in this quiz is kind of long. It says, imagine that a researcher is interested in whether residents in his local area have higher levels of well-being than the national average. What would be an appropriate alternate or alternative hypothesis for a one-tailed or directional z-test for this test? And the choices are that the local residence average is less than the national average, that their average is higher than the national average, that it's equal to the national average, or that none of these choices are appropriate. Remember, we're asking about the alter alternate or alternative hypothesis. Well, here's what we get. The alternate, the, sorry, I keep mixing up. The alternative hypothesis here, that is the one that we're interested in, is that the local residence average is greater than the national average. Now, let me show you what these look like symbolically. Remember, when you're doing a hypothesis test, the hypotheses come in pairs. You have a null hypothesis, which means that nothing's going on, or at least nothing of interest. And you have an alternate or alternative hypothesis. And the alternative hypothesis is usually the one that we're interested in. So in this case, the person wanted to know whether the mean for their uh, local group is higher than the mean for the national group. So that's, I have it written down here as mu because it's about population means. So the mean of for the population of local residents is higher than the mean of the population nationally. And the, the, altern, the alternative hypothesis is written to be the complement to this. And so the, uh, the alternative simply says greater than, so the, because the hypotheses need to be mutually exclusive and comprehensive, the, uh, the null needs to be less than and equal to. Um, anyhow, that's what it looks like. Second question, also a long one. Imagine two studies that are identical in every way, in every respect, except the size of their samples. Okay, sample A has an effect size of d, Cohen's d is equal to 20, and a p-value of 03. Sample B has an effect size of d equals 20 and a p-value of 005. So same effect size and different p-values. Which sample likely has the smaller sample size? And A, they're the same, B sample B, C sample A, or D cannot be determined without additional information. Well, the answer on this one is sample A. Let's take a quick look here. Um, what we have is that sample A um, has a, the, A and B both have the same effect size. And so you see these charts here on the right? These show distributions that are the same distance apart from each other, that the peaks are the same distance. And that um, the smallest sample is at the top and the largest sample is at the bottom. Because remember, what sample size does, the bigger the sample, the smaller the standard error. So the narrower the distribution. And you get this effect. There's less and less overlap. And the p-value has a lot to do with overlap. And so you see here that sample A which has a p-value of 0.3, okay, fine. That's, that's actually still statistically significant. But... Um, but B has a value of 005, so B's overlap, its p-value is much smaller, even though it has the same effect size. So B must have a larger sample, which means that A has the smaller sample. And now for the third question. Imagine two studies that are identical in every respect except their effect sizes and p-values. Sample A has a p-value of 01, and sample B has a p-value of 0 0.10. Which sample likely had the larger effect size? And the choices are A, B, or they're the same, or can't be determined without additional information. Well, in this case, the answer is A, and it helps to look at the z-score formula. The effect size is going to have a lot to do with the difference between uh, the means. That's what's on the top here. Um, and what happens, though, is that the p-value is going to change. If that part up there it changes, the p-value is going to work into z, and the effect size is going to get bigger or smaller depending on that particular difference. And the bigger the value, the bigger the distance between those um, means, then the larger the z-score is, and also the smaller the p-value is. And that's how that works here. So don't forget, um, bigger sample size, smaller p-value. All right. Number four, when the mean of the population that a sample comes from does not differ from the general population, but the sample mean is nonetheless significantly different from the general population, 
then A, a sampling error has been made, or B, a type 1 error has occurred, or C, a type 2 error has occurred, or D, the researcher should gather new data. Well, it's a long and confusing question, but it's representative of what you're going to get on the final, so you need to find a way to deal with these things. The answer in this case is B, a type 1 error has occurred. And here's how it works. Um, what we're talking about, let's, let's take a quick look. The mean of the population that a sample comes from does not differ from the general population. That means that the null hypothesis is true. But the sample mean is nonetheless significantly different from the general population than a type 1 error has occurred. So, you see, we've got this black X. It's in the red zone on this one. And what it's saying is it's past a critical value, and so you would assume that it's the null hypothesis is not true. But it is possible to get a score this big from the null distribution. It doesn't happen very often, less than 5% of the time, but it can happen. And if that is, in fact, the case of what happened, then you've committed a type 1 error. And again, I want to say it's not that you were foolish in how you conducted the study. It's just random sampling does that to you a certain number of uh, times. Again, about 5% of the time. All right, the last question for uh, quiz three. If a researcher is comparing a sample mean to a population mean and gets Cohen's D of negative 2.0, this means that um, A, the sample mean is two standard errors away from the population mean, or B, the effect is statistically significant, or C, a mistake was made because Cohen's D cannot be negative, or D, the sample mean is two standard deviations below the population mean. The answer in this case is D, the sample mean is two standard deviations below the population mean. I'll show you that in a second. But let me just say, A here, the sample mean is two standard errors away from the population mean. That would be true if we got a Z score of negative 2.0. That's what that would mean. Also, the effect is statistically significant. If we were doing a, um, a Z test and we were using a two-tailed or non-directional test with an alpha of 0.5, that gives us critical values of plus or minus 1.96, and 2.0 is farther away than 1.96. Yeah, if this were a z-score and we were doing a z-test and we had those things, that would be true, but that's not what we're asking about. Um, see this idea that a Cohen's z can't be negative? No, all that means is that the sample mean is below the population mean, the same way we deal with z-scores. And again, take a look at the formula here. All you knew is you take the sample mean, x-bar, Subtract the population mean that gets you how far above or below the population mean is divided by the standard deviation. And again, so as a Cohen's D of negative 2.0 means that the sample mean is two standard deviations below the population mean. And that's it for the third quiz on chapter 8.